All right. Let's see. You guys can hear me, I'm assuming, again. Uh, and hopefully you can, can you see my picture up in the upper corner there? Um, great. All right. Well, uh, welcome to the first online version of uh, 162. We'll see how this works. And hopefully this won't be a long term uh, fix. But uh, for now, it's good to keep everybody safe. Um, what we're going to do today is we're going to pick up where we left off on um, last Thursday and continue with our discussion of address translation. And as you recall, uh, we sort of had a multi-segment uh, mode that we were talking about, which had a set of uh, registers that were base limit pairs. And by having more than one segment, we at least would be able to have a little more flexibility to share segments between multiple processes and so on. And so the idea is that this segment map, this green one, was in the processor. Um, you take a virtual address where the top, uh, how many bits is this going to be? This is going to be three bits uh, because we have eight options. The top um, basically would point at uh, the particular segment we were interested in. We would take that base, we'd add it to our offset. And uh, that would essentially give us um, a physical address. And then, of course, the other thing we need to do is check to make sure we didn't um, go over the, um, the offset. It uh, wasn't too big. Didn't go over the limit. And we also are going to want to check uh, the valid bits to make sure that uh, this is even a valid segment. Now, we'll talk more about this later. But uh, the other thing I mentioned is, although we're talking about the segment itself uh, coming up here, um, as part of the address, so we're taking three bits off the top of the address. Uh, later, we'll also talk how, about how certain processors like the x86, the segment is actually in the, um, is actually in the uh, instruction itself. Now, I'm kind of interested to see how we're going to make this work in terms of questions. Um, one of the things is you all have a group chat. You guys can uh, send chats to me if you like. Uh, the other option, uh, I suppose we could try is having people raise their hand to actually ask a question. Um, that may be another option. Uh, let's see what works and what doesn't. So this is our experiment for today. Um, so uh, continuing on with this, I'm just wondering if there were any questions or are we good on this? All right, good. We even got a thumbs up. Very nice. So um, moving along here, um, the, the next thing that we might want to do is uh, continue on this uh, to see what we can do about fixing a pretty serious problem we've got here. So the pretty serious problem is that essentially with segmentation, we get holes that uh, are not easy to get rid of. So we have to take variable size chunks. You know, these processes are of different sizes. We got to fit them into physical memory in some way that's contiguous. Because if you look back here, we're really talking about a base plus a limit, which uh, essentially means that uh, we're talking about a chunk of memory that's um, possibly variable size. That limit could be quite large. And so you might have to end up moving for instance, perhaps pre process 11 doesn't fit in either of these chunks. So we might have to actually copy process 9 and 10 up so that we make room for process 11. And uh, that's, that's a lot of overhead. And so this basically gives us pretty limited options for swapping to disk. Um, and so um, you know, we basically have to swap out the whole thing. We have to deal with fragments. And uh, this fragmentation problem is essentially uh, a wasted space problem because uh, notice that right now these two chunks of unused memory can't be used by anybody. So that's actually external fragmentation. Um, and then we have to move that up, maybe move process 11 in here. Um, and then perhaps just to make sure that we can grow process 11, we have to leave some space. And that potentially would be internal fragmentation. So um, this seems like a nice first step because it's very easy to do. But let's see if we can do better. All right. And so to do that, we're going to. Um, have an essential observation here. The problem is that we have big chunks of variable size. And uh, that basically leads us to this situation where we um, have to move things around. And so instead, what we're going to do is we're going to have smaller chunks of fixed size. Okay, And so this is 
going to be our solution. So um, our fixed size chunks we're going to call pages, not to surprise anybody, I'm sure. And every chunk of physical memory is going to be equivalent so that we don't have to go copying around things. And um, uh, let's see, as we, uh, since they're all the same size, in fact, we can even have free memories kept as a bit vector. So sort of a zero means that the memory is free and a one means that it's allocated. And we can do this because every chunk is equivalent. And so each one of these might mean uh, that there's a chunk of memory that's in use. Um, and each of these might be of some size. We'll decide what that is, but we're going to say 4K, for instance, for now. All right. And um, leading back to our question about fragmentation, uh, we could ask ourselves whether um, we have uh, pages as big as the previous ones, and the answer to that is going to be no, because if we allocate really large pages, we're going to have a lot of internal fragmentation. Okay, and so typically we have small pages in the 1K to 16K range. 4K uh, is pretty common, 16K more common, um, and so every segment that we were talking about previously is now going to be a number of segments. Okay, and we could selectively have very large pages for things that don't change much, like the kernel. Um, maybe we even have gigabyte size pages there, and we'll talk more about that later. But for now, we're going to keep small ones um, to avoid internal fragmentation. All right. So, um, any questions on that? Are we good? Okay. And I'm going to assume that people who have questions raise their hand or because uh, there's a little hand symbol you can do, or they send something to the group chat. That's probably the simplest thing for now, because that way I can um, just look over off to the side here. All right, so let's, let's do something uh, about this. So if we want to implement simple paging, we need to somehow come up with our, um, uh, come up with our translation table. And so here's what this might look like. Um, we're going to have each of our pages is going to have a separate entry now, okay, one per process. And uh, each of these entries is now going to define a particular physical page in memory and some uh, permission bits, okay? And um, it's gonna give us a virtual address mapping here, all right? So uh, our virtual address mapping is uh, going to be as follows. Um, we take our virtual page number now, and uh, oh, okay, just copy the offset. And our virtual page number is going to help us pick uh, one entry in here, which is going to give us the physical page number. And by concatenating the physical page in the offset, we get our final total mapping. So this is a little different from what we did with uh, segments, if you remember earlier, uh, where we were actually doing some summation. Um, and the reason for that is that all of these uh, chunks are the same size, um, say 4K. And um, of course, uh, here, you know, if they're 1K, uh, for instance, that might be 10 bits. If they're 4K, that's going to be 12 bits. Um, if you remember, I warned you guys last time that uh, it's going to be time for you to learn your powers of two. Uh, but um, so basically, this virtual page number is an index into our page. And what we get out of that is a real page number or a physical page number that we uh, replace those bits with for the offset. So if this offset were 10 bits, so it's 1,024 uh, bytes per page. Then how much is this left? Well, at a 32-bit address, there would be 22 bits here. That's a lot of pages. And those 22 bits uh, would select an index, um, which would then uh, give us a new 22 bits, which points to a particular uh, 4K page, OK? Um, and then, of course, the problem is we're not going to have all of these. So 22 is basically uh, 22 bits is four megabytes. Uh, so that are four million. So that's a lot of pages. And so we're basically going to have our page table size, uh, which we're going to compare with the particular page number we ask for. And if we're too big, so we're down here at page six, for instance, um, then we're going to get an access error. And we're also going to check our permission bits, okay, just like we did before. Now it's different here over what we had before, and uh, potentially a lot more powerful is that now every one of these pages are the same size and we can map them into physical memory. I'll show you that in a little bit. Um, and if we decide that we're no longer using these six pages, we can just put them back on the free list and another process can use them. And uh, we don't have to do any copying or whatever because just because page six might not be uh, 
in this uh, contiguous in physical memory, it totally doesn't matter because the virtual address space is still contiguous. And I have uh, a couple of really good slides I'm going to show you in a second that make that a little more clear. Okay. So I know it's very hard to ask questions in a virtual environment like this, but um, are we, uh, oh, we do have a couple of questions. Okay, so um, both offset lengths. So one question here was, are both offset lengths the same here? And the answer is yes, because all we're doing is we're literally taking the offset bits from this and copying them over here. Okay, so you're just copying them. And um, I see we also have people answering questions. Okay, that's great. <laughs> Sorry, I'll have to uh, watch this a little more carefully. But um, so basically the reason we're copying is we're not adding and we're literally, we're picking a 4K page based on what we want. And then once we have that 4K page, the offset is sort of saying which of, for instance, those 4K bytes are in use or in the case of a 1K page, which of those 1K bytes are in use. All right. Great, we're on the same virtual page. So let me show you a very simple example here. So these are four byte pages, all right? And um, so this is pretty small, but it's trying to get you the idea. So this page table has uh, a small number of entries in it, okay? So the first entry points to physical page four, the second entry points to physical page three, physical page one. And if you notice here, um, let's uh, take a look so if we're interested in the following address, so 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, um, what we're gonna do is translate that. And since our pages are only four bytes uh, in size, we know that only uh, two bits are enough to talk about every byte that we might run into. So our offset for our four byte pages is just two bits, all right? And the, the rest of the address here all, uh, is all zeros, so that's gonna point at this first entry. And so the way we get our translated address is we literally take the, um, the offset bits, copy them here, and then we take our uh, virtual uh, page number, and that's all zeros, and we put our virtual page number in here to get uh, index zero, giving us back four. Now you guys all see this, zero, 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 one, zero, zero is four. We concatenate the two of them together, and that actually points us somewhere down here. Now I say that this is uh, hex, one zero and that's because if you divide four bits off you get a one and a zero and so this is down here so what we've translated is this part in the virtual space points to this part in the physical space all right and um, for instance another example here here's the and by the way since this these two bits uh, are zero that means we're talking about the first byte a is really down here in physical memory here the two bits are again zero um, but this is now uh, page number one, because it's 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, all right? And so E, because that's the beginning of that page, gets translated down here to uh, this address, 0, C. And by the way, 1, 1, 0, 0 is C, okay? So the question that uh, is on here is, why is the virtual page number uh, six bits? Don't we just need two bits for it? That's a, good, that's a good question. And the answer is that in this architecture, we have an eight bit architecture. And so we need to fill out all the bits, okay? And so we need all six bits, even though we don't have many pages in our page table. And the way that would be reflected, if you look back at this previous slide, is this uh, virtual page number is compared with the total page uh, table size. And if we're up here, um, then we get a fault, okay? And so if you look here, um, in this case, we've got, we've got six bits, which uh, if you were to very quickly compute would give us 64 total page possibilities. We only have three pages. And so if we were to have something in these bits up top here, that would cause an access error. Hopefully that uh, answered that question. All right, now, um, um, are we good on that? Okay, great. So let's go forward here now. So if you look at um, uh, eight, uh, page eight here, um, which is I, or excuse me, that's byte eight, um, is zero, 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 one, zero, and uh, the two lower bits. And so if you look at page two is a one, so we put a zero, 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 one, concatenate the two zeros, and that has I up here. Now, um, you know, this is kind of, we all always got zeros here, so that's kind of boring. But what about, for instance, uh, byte six, which is G. 
if you look here, six is zero 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 one one zero. So that's the virtual address for byte six. If we split that up, we notice that we are offset two one zero and page one. And so when we translate that, we look up page one, that gives us a three. We copy the offset and that ends up being right here. That's why G is over there. And the same with nine. Uh, again, you can do that translation and that's, uh, excuse me, up there, okay? So um, basically this offset is literally copied and because there are two bits, it's four possible bytes in the page, which corresponds to four possible bytes, you know, and the virtual address corresponds to four possible bytes in the physical address. Okay, good. Now, um, next, uh, what about sharing? So what's interesting is one of our uh, justifications originally for um, going to the multi-segment model was sort of to give us a sharing model um, where we could share pages. And if you look here, for instance, in this case of the page table, we can have uh, process A has a page table and virtual page uh, might look up page number two. Um, we copy uh, the offset to find out where we are. Um, process B could have a different page table, but by design, these two entries, the uh, physical page number in page uh, number two of this page table and page number four of this page table point to the shared page, which means, ta-da, we have a physical page shared between these two processes. All right. Uh, so that sounds interesting. So that means that, um, and notice by the way, the permissions here are uh, valid read and this is valid read and write. So this process only gets to read the page whereas this process gets to write the page. Uh, but those of you that are thinking out there might wonder a little bit about this. Can anybody tell me what's a little weird about the way I set up sharing in this instance? Anybody think? No. All right. Ah, well, one, one possibility is if one process crash, will it crash the other one? That's a good, that's a good thought, but the answer is no. There's something funny about what I did here in terms of where I placed this pointer. See how it's number two here, but it's number four here. Can anybody figure out what that would do to the way uh, process A and B view this data? Yeah, different virtual addresses, very good. So uh, what that means here is that yes, this page is shared, but if I put any object in here like a linked list or something where the addresses mattered, um, these two processes are gonna see this data at different addresses and a linked list is not gonna work <laughs> because an address that makes sense for process uh, A isn't gonna make sense for process B. So the way I've set this up, the only type of sharing you could do is something that's location independent. I mean, you could have, um, I don't know, objects that don't have pointers in them, for instance. Um, probably would want to actually map this uh, second one at page two in process B, and then they could put linked list, et cetera, in there, okay? So, good catch. Now, where is page sharing useful? Well, the kernel region of every process typically has the same page table entries, and, um, although we'll talk about the, some of the consequences of that in a second. Um, the process can't access it, but when the kernel is uh, running, um, when we're running in the kernel mode, then uh, the kernel can get at stuff um, easily and potentially um, what it really does is it kind of allows the, uh, the kernel to have access to the user's pages. So what happens is when we go into kernel mode, the kernel gets all of the user's pages, all right? Um, Different processes uh, can be running the same binary. So what's interesting about what I showed you here is if this were location independent code or um, we had mapped it to the same address, then you could actually put a binary in here and suddenly um, you could execute the same code in A and B um, with only one physical copy. And this is exactly what's done to uh, make sure that um, if you load multiple versions of the same program at the same time, they can all share the same executable, okay? 
So the question is, why won't pointer dereferencing work? Uh, because basically, they um, let's suppose that there's a pointer that says that the next. Uh, uh, so this is um, this question is back to this slide again here. So the question is really, if I have a linked list and I have a pointer from one link to the next, that pointer is going to point to an address that makes sense to say process A which is gonna be in this part of the address space. So that's gonna be where there's a two in here and it's gonna to point to the next link. But something that's got a two in it is gonna point off into private space in process B. So those pointers are not, um, are not going to be common to the two. Does that make sense? Great. So, uh, the other thing that this is very useful for is we talked about uh, shared libraries uh, last class. And um, by sharing data, you can share libraries. And in fact, that's exactly what happens uh, when um, you have libraries that uh, might be commonly linked, of course, across a bunch of processes. Uh, and then in that instance, you actually get to share the binaries. Okay, so. Um, and then uh, another thing that's in general kind of useful is shared memory segments. Now we haven't talked about how to do this, but if you have two processes, you know, we talked about, well, the big thing about processes is they, they are protected from each other. Well, in some instances, the two processes actually wanna be talking to each other. And you've already done things like generated pipes and used files and so on, sockets to communicate together. What you can also do is you can, you can ask for a shared memory segment to be created uh, between the two processes. And now suddenly, just like we were talking about in this previous slide, they can read and write an actual shared page. And this is uh, technology that you'll, uh, we'll talk more about um, maybe next time, uh, that it's a system call that you can call to, to get a shared page mapped between the two processes. And now suddenly you can share a linked list. Um, and uh, so that's, I like to think of that as uh, intentional or careful hole punching between the, the uh, boundaries uh, between the two processes. We po poke a very careful hole and share a page so that now they can communicate, but in a way that we're intending to communicate. Okay. So um, I don't want to uh, get past our basic page mapping here. We're gonna, we're gonna do some optimizations on it in a moment, but uh, we could, always map things in exactly the same way, including the kernel and binaries and so on. And that is actually what was done once. But uh, many of you who might have taken 161 or whatever are probably hold of, heard of things like buffer overflow attacks, where an attacker manages to um, cause the uh, program that's running to overflow its stack in a way that lets that uh, process introduce maybe a new return co uh, return um, code or whatever so that the um, rather than returning to where it was supposed to it actually ends up returning to something that the attacker is selected and so one of the uh, ways that modern systems uh, work against that is they uh, randomize the placement of where binaries and stacks and heaps are as a way of making it very hard to do these kind of buffer overflow attacks and so um, to do that typically you need to have code that can run anywhere and so you can build essentially position independent code um, where you can have just a random start address and uh, as a result the things that an attacker might try to insert into a stack once they've taken control are much harder to figure out because the code that they're trying to jump to is uh, different every time they attack. Um, the stack and the heap can clearly start anywhere so you can randomize the placement of those and by and large these are pretty good countermeasures um, they don't entirely uh, prevent buffer overflow attacks, but they make them much more difficult and they're easy enough to do once you've got memory mapping. Another thing that's uh, interesting here is you don't map the whole kernel. So and I'll show you a map in a second um, of a standard uh, Linux mapping from, I'm gonna say a couple of years ago, where uh, you basically had user space was the, the uh, bottom three quarters of the space and the upper three quarters was kernel. And the kernel, uh, all of the kernel data structures were mapped up here in the purple, uh, but they were mapped in a way that was supposedly protected from the user. Okay. Um, and if you don't map as much kernel space, then it's harder to, um, it's harder to attack 
And so in user mode, there might be just a little bit of kernel um, that's uh, peeking through. And when you, when you transition through a system call or whatever, you have a fully separate page table that has uh, the user space mapped exactly the same way, but the kernel is now mapped in full. And uh, so that's basically going from one page table to two almost identical page tables. And I'm going to show you in a little bit why it's very easy to do something like this, because we can essentially have the same part of the page table um, that maps user space uh, map in a different kernel, um, or excuse me, in a different page table for the kernel. OK. Um, and then, of course, we talked about Meltdown. And we'll talk more about this. But um, basically, because of the Meltdown uh, attack, and um, call it a bug in processors, um, we noticed that if we had done this, where we have user mode, kernel mode together in the same page table protected uh, only by protection bits, that it was possible for uh, a user program to essentially get all of the protected data out of the kernel. And that was bad. And so um, this meltdown protection basically encouraged there to be essentially nothing of the kernel mapped at all in uh, the user's page table. And we will talk a little bit more about that uh, as we go forward. So here we go. Here is an example of a pre-meltdown 32-bit uh, address space for Linux. And uh, it's more interesting than we've kind of led you to believe up till now. So clearly, uh, from uh, 0xc, 0 up is kernel space. And uh, this is protected uh, with page table entries that say kernel only. And I'll show you the page table entries uh, momentarily. But then the stack is not jammed up against the top of the kernel. It's randomly placed. Uh, and the heap is randomly placed. OK. And uh, there's an additional memory mapping segment that's kind of in the middle of these. So unlike what we told you before, where the stack grows down, the heap grows up, and there's nothing between, there's actually a segment in the middle where they put things like dynamic libraries and anonymous memory mappings for shared pages and so on. Okay. And then the uh, um, other things are kind of put down at the bottom and uh, carefully initialized and some randomization there, too, where it's required. Okay. So that's our, that's our actual memory map. Are we good for questions? Now, um, I, I wanted to show you, this is exactly the same thing we said with the page table earlier, but it's a different uh, way of looking at things. So on the left, we have virtual memory. And on the right, we have physical memory. And the virtual memory is an address space that's used by the processor. And the physical memory is the address space used by the DRAM. And if you look, what happens is what's in the middle, the translation of the page table. So um, going back to our simplistic view of the memory, uh, ignoring what I said here um, about more interesting complexities. Um, here, what you see is the stack uh, has a couple of pages that are mapped uh, through the page table to uh, a place that we've randomly placed in physical memory. So the fact that this stack is jammed up at the top of our address space doesn't say anything about where these pages are in physical memory because they're all the same size. There's no requirement. OK, so for instance, this um, you know, 1111 uh, and the top basically goes through the page table and maps down through the page table to something that's not necessarily jammed at the top. Um, and uh, could, in fact, be down at the bottom here, and it would still work. Uh, and the stack could continue to grow down and the heap up, but notice that we've, in fact, got a bunch of holes in here. And uh, so interestingly here, if you have a program that uh, pushes and needs more stack, what's happened here is, if you notice, before we had uh, only two pages of stack, and now we're trying to use more pages. And what happens here? Well, we get a page full, which we'll talk more about. And now the kernel says, oh, the program needs more stack. What are we going to do? Well, it finds a couple of new pages, puts them into the page table. And now, though the, although we have uh, a continuous stack in the virtual space, it's split up in physical space. And this just, uh, there's no problem with this, because the page table basically uh, stitches these together to give the user virtual memory view a nice contiguous view of things. Okay, and this is a much uh, 
better from an organizational standpoint than what we showed you earlier where the, we had to deal with segments that maybe needed to be copied and moved. Here, we never have to copy and move because every page is the same size. All right. Now, uh, the challenge, unfortunately here, is this page table is big. Okay, and notice all these null entries, okay? Even though I have a bunch of physical memory that's not in use by this process, I still have all of these null entries. Now these things in gray might be being used by a different process, but that doesn't mean that this page table doesn't have to have null entries for everything, whether or not it's being used, okay? And if you think through why that is, the reason is that we have a very simplistic translation mechanism. We take and we split some bits off the top and we use those bits as an index into the page table. Let me back this up. So if we didn't have all these nulls in here, then the parts down here um, that we're trying to look up uh, parts of the table would go to index and it would index incorrectly because we need to reserve space in this page table for future use. And this space is directly related to the size of virtual memory, not to the amount of physical memory that we're using. Okay? So, potentially uh, problematic from that standpoint. All right, so how big does this get? All right, so if you look, we have a 32-bit address space, for instance, so two to the 32 bytes is about four gigabytes. Um, note here that B, is a bit and cap small b is a bit and capital b is a byte keep that in mind this is a very important convention so we're talking about gigabytes here not gigabits and for memory the other thing to note about is that a kilogram a kilobyte or bit whatever kilo is 2 to the 10th which is 1024 uh, omega is 2 to the 20th which is uh 1024 squared and a giga is 2 to the 30th, which is 1024 cubed. And the thing to note, and I'm going to say this, and the reason I'm saying this is because you need to know uh, this so you're not confused in the future. Notice that a kilobyte is not quite 10 to the third bytes, and a megabyte is not quite a million bytes, and a gigabyte is not quite a billion bytes. Okay, it's a little more. Okay, but that is convention, and we use that convention when we're talking about memory sizes. The, way, the reason this gets very confusing is when we start talking about bandwidths for the network, or talking about the size even of uh, disks, disk blocks, then we go back to the standard kilo, mega, giga, which are powers of 10, rather than the kilo, mega, and giga that are powers of two. And um, if in 61A or B, I think you talked about kibby, mibby, and gibby bytes, um, which, is all very cute sounding, but um, not as often used as you might like. <laughs> so I guess you just have to deal with uh, ambiguity. And if you choose to put a kibby bite down, um, most people will know what you're talking about, but not all of them. So typical page ties is four kilobytes. Ah, to clarify, they're pronounced. Uh, the question is, are these pronounced the same but capitalized differently? No. <laughs> Unfortunately, they're pronounced, uh, they're capitalized the same and pronounced differently, if you wanted to say that. So, kibby byte is K little i b byte. Kilobyte, when it's dealing with memory, it looks exactly like kilobyte when it's dealing with bandwidth, and you just got to know the context to know whether we're talking about a power of 2 or a power of 10. So uh, welcome to the world of uh, ambiguity. And yes, indeed, it's context specific. Isn't this fun? Uh, if, if everything did was done the way they teach you in 61A, it'd be great. But unfortunately, not everybody does that. So a typical page size is four kilobytes. So that's, uh, how big is it? Well, uh, one kilobyte is two to the 10th. That's a number you all should know. So four kilobytes is two to the 12th, which is 12 bits. So if a page is four kilobytes, our offset's 12 bits. So how big is a page table? So look back here, see this? How big is this guy? Well, we split off 12 bits. What's left in 32 bits is 20, which is, well, it's a million. Uh, and each one of those entries is about four bytes. You'll see that at the end of the lecture. So we're talking about four megabytes 
just for this page table, much of which is null because we've got a sparse address space. So that seems pretty wasteful. Okay. And uh, back in the day, this was really bad, okay, because 16 megabytes was a huge amount. And uh, so wasting four megabytes on your page table seemed pretty bad. Um, so how big is a 64-bit processor's page table if we do it this way? Well, 2 to the 64th over 2 to the 12th um, is going to give us about uh, times 8 bytes each because the entries have to be bigger. That's about 36 exabytes, which is ridiculous amount of memory. So this page table thing I just showed you by itself is clearly broken. Too big, too much empty space. Okay, and so the address space is sparse and what we need is something to deal with a sparse address space. So what needs to be switched on a context switch here? Well, uh, the page table pointer clearly needs to be switched. All right, uh, what provides protection? Both uh, per process translation table and the dual mode, we're gonna mention that again, that prevents the process from changing its own page table. So, Pros of this page table is it's very simple to do out memory allocation because all the pages are the same size. It's very easy to share. The cons are if the address space is sparse, which it is, <laughs> uh, you waste a lot of space. Uh, if the table is really big, not all the pages are used at the time. So uh, even this big page table would be great if we could page out the page table. So um, way too big. So we need to do something else. And what we're going to do is we're going to figure out a better structure than just a linear page table. All right. So administrivia. Uh, well, CS162 went virtual. Woohoo! Welcome, everybody, to uh, Kubitao at CS162 Zoomcast. Um, we will have to decide whether this works or not. Uh, um, is there a, Kobe, are you asking a question? Or are you clapping? Oh, I see you're clapping. Oh, very good. <laughs> I have to look at, I have to figure out the symbols. Uh, so um, Zoom links for discussion sections and office hours are not all available yet, but they're gonna start being available. Um, and because uh, we don't have to go in person anymore, um, I think we should get back in the habit of essentially um, attending discussion sessions because um, I'm very worried we're gonna lose you guys um, so that uh, I, don't want, I don't want you to get lost and not have contact with staff. So um, make sure that you uh, try to attend the discussion sessions. There is a calendar at the bottom of the course uh, calendar page. Let's just make sure you all um, try to uh, look up that, uh, find your uh, Zoom discussion session and log in. Now, if you look right now, you'll see that a bunch of them are missing. Um, your, a bunch of your TAs don't have Zoom sessions, and we haven't put them uh, out by the um, sections either, but we'll get that back, okay? So um, these live lectures, uh, unfortunately, today are not captioned, but they will be live captioned um, uh, starting Thursday, and the recording that comes out of this will also probably get live captioned, um, just so you know, and I haven't figured out whether I'm going to try to uh, have these posted in the standard um, place for the course capture, or whether I'll put them up on my own um, YouTube uh, channel or whatever. I haven't figured that out yet. But uh, we're making this all up as we go. Were there any questions on Administrivia? We could. Okay. So, um, let me know uh, whether this is working or not. Let's see, our se uh, section discussion Zoom links to be posted on Piazza. Probably, that's a good, that's a good question, and I think we could certainly do that. Um, I, uh, uh, there'll be lots of places to put them, and uh, however we can get that info to you would be um, good. The other question was, are the design documents, uh, or design doc review gonna be due virtually? Yes. Uh, and this is why this is going to be very important that we figure out a good etiquette for talking. I think in the design reviews, we'll have uh, everybody's mic can be enabled. And, uh, and let's just figure out how to make this work. Um, personally, I want to make sure that you guys all get as much contact with 
the staff as, as you're used to. It's just going to be uh, talking heads on a screen. Um, and um, I'm quite sure that the, the, uh, the status of uh, fake uh, people is not quite good enough for us to uh, um, head off to the Bahamas while, uh, while these uh, AI teach you um, CS162. That unfortunately isn't going to happen yet. And besides the fact that I don't think we'd want to get on an airplane to do that. So you're going to have real people <laughs> behind, uh, behind the mask. And uh, let's see what we can do to make this work for you guys. And um, maybe uh, people will calm down and the, um, everything will be uh, looking a little less scary for everybody. And we can get back to live classes before the end of the term. That would be my goal. I'm not sure that's going to happen, but let's see if it can. And I'm certainly um, up for talking with anybody individually um, if you uh, really want to chat. And uh, of course, if you're not sick, but um, let me know. Uh, I will try to answer emails and you can post things on Piazza and so on. All right. So uh, sorry about this. It's, uh, and if you see your faculty running around looking crazy trying to figure out what's going on, it's because none of us know how this is going to work. So just uh, bear with us and we'll figure it out. <laughs> so, all righty. Uh, I don't, any other questions or should we go on? Okay. So, let's fix this problem. Um, and uh, the problem I'm referring to is just this ridiculous size of the page table. So, if what we're going to do is we're going to build a two level page table. Oh, when we talk about sparse address space, is that relevant for virtual memory? and not the, the DRAM, this is going to be relevant for virtual memory, but it's mapping to the DRAM. So uh, let's see if, uh, if we answer your question or not, and you can uh, ask it again uh, later. How's that sound? So um, basically, we're going to have a pointer to a uh, page table, but this page table is going to be small, okay? And in fact, we're going to have four byte entries, which I will explain um, anon very shortly. Um, and these four byte entries are going to be uh, pointers to other pages, but this thing here is going to be just a single 4K page. And we're going to do what I like to call the magic 10 bit, 10 bit, 12 bit pattern. And what's magic about this is this is a pattern that works perfectly. Okay, so we take 10 bits, which is, if you uh, remember, uh, 1000, excuse me, 24, and that 1024 entries. 1,024 times 4 is 4K. So, ta-da, this is exactly 4K in size. And we're going to pick one of 1,024 entries based on the first 10 bits. That's going to give us a page table entry that points to another page where we're going to take the next 10 bits, okay, which is going to pick a page table entry. And that's going to finally point to uh, a page. And if you look, we'll copy the offset, of course, from here to here. And when we're done, we have the physical page number of the final address. And so these guys in the middle are a couple of levels of lookup, and this is the final page. And so when we're accessing this virtual address, this page over in the far, um, in the far right here is the page we access in physical DRAM. But what's interesting about this is that, for instance, these guys in the middle are also the same size. So these are also 4K. And what's all what's and what I, why I call this magic again is this 10 bits, 10 bits, 12 bits exactly works out, and we use 32 bits when we're done. And um, interestingly enough, uh, once we've done it this way, then uh, as you probably realize, some of these things can be empty or sparse or null, is what we called it earlier, and so we could actually if we were not using this part of the page at this moment, we could mark this page table entry up at the root as null or uh, not present, as I'll show you in a moment. And then we could send this page out to disk. And so this page table could be only partially in memory. So what's cool about this is that we have a two level page table and we don't even have to have all of it in memory at once. And furthermore, it de deals with sparseness much better. So those big tracks, if you remember where uh, we left space for the stack to grow and space for the heap to grow, they would correspond to null entries here in this top level page table that map to nothing. And so we don't have to waste that space on the second level page table. All right. And so this 
the good thing about this is really that uh, we can now suddenly deal with sparseness pretty well. Okay. Um, and uh, this is, by the way, the, you know, the 10, 10, 12 is exactly what you see in the classic 32-bit uh, address space translation for x86. Um, Intel, uh, which loves to name things in their own way, call this, uh, uh, here's the two levels of page table. They, tell the top, they call the top one a page directory, the, the lower one a page table but it's exactly what we just talked about. This little PS is page size, uh, and I'll show you that in a moment. This basically says it's pointing at a page table as opposed to pointing at a four megabyte page, okay? And which, so if you uh, look at that, we could split off 22 bits and just have a top level directory point at a really large chunk of memory, and we might wanna do that in the um, kernel, for instance, if we weren't moving things around. And the other thing to point out is this thing called register CR3 is one of those uh, control registers that you can only get at from kernel mode, and it points to the top of the, the page directory. And so this is what we were calling the page table pointer earlier. And now you can see that the, when we um, context switch to a new process, all we have to do is um, change CR3, and suddenly we have a brand new page table that we're using and we don't even have to touch these things in memory so they just stay in physical memory we change cr3 to a different set of things in physical memory and suddenly we've just changed the address space and so this is pretty nice from the standpoint of uh if we change from a thread in one process to a thread in another we're just going to change cr3 now of course everything's more complicated than that uh, than you hear the first time because we also have to deal with um, segment registers and so on, but this basic idea is pretty good, okay? Pretty close. So now, um, the, uh, what's in each one of these page table entries, okay? So a page table entry is this thing here, or, you know, these things here, okay? Each of those are page table entries. They're four bytes. What do they look like? Well, um, it's got to have a pointer to the next level page table and permission bits, and so here's the x86 page table entry. Um, it's 32 bits. The top 20 are literally pointing to the next page in either the page table or the final uh, page that we're mapping to. And why is, 20, uh, why is 20 bits the right thing? Well, 20 bits is the right thing because uh, a page is 12, it takes out 12 bits and we need to map the physical page frame number is 20 bits. And so that's a million possible 4K pages in the world. Go back to this picture again. This guy, when it's mapping to some page in physical space, there are 20 bits worth of possible physical pages in a maximally filled 32-bit uh, DRAM. Okay. So uh, that's why these this top page frame is 20 bits. But what about the rest of them? Well, this lower bit is a very important one. That's the present bit, uh, which uh, Intel calls present. It's called valid and everywhere else. And that basically says whether this page table entry is even valid. So if we want to have a null entry, we mark this as a zero. And then suddenly the rest of the bits, all 31 of them, are available for the operating system to do something else with. Um, we'll talk more about that when we talk about paging next time. Uh, the W bit is whether it's writable or not. Okay, so if it's uh, not writable, then um, you set that to a zero and an attempt to write would give you a page fault. Um, U is whether the user can do it or not, use it or not. If that's a zero, then only the kernel can touch it. And these other ones are about external caching and so on. Maybe we'll talk about that a little bit later. This A and D bits are information bits. So what's interesting about this is they keep track of uh, whether a page has been accessed recently or whether it's been written to, and those will be part of the clock algorithm when we talk about paging. This is the page size bit that I mentioned earlier. If it's a zero, then this is just pointing to the next level page table. But if it's a one, we can point at four megabyte pages, et cetera. Okay, so this is our basic page table entry. And if you add these all up, there are four, there's four total bytes here because it's 32 bits. And that is literally what I meant by uh, these four, this is a four byte uh, entry. And what can we do with this? This is just a preview, but um, there's some things we talked about in uh, the use of fork and so on that suddenly become valid here. So how do we use this page table entry? Well, there's a lot of bits, right? 
So one of the things we'll talk about next time is uh, we can use the, the A and D bits and the P bit and the W bit for a clock algorithm. So that's kind of interesting. And that's for uh, making the virtual memory look like a cache. But what else can we do with it? Well, for instance, um, we can, uh, and, and by the way, I, just so you know, if we mark something as invalid, then that's a part of the address space that um, will cause a page fault and you may have to go to disk because we've paged things out. But other things that are interesting um, along those lines is that means that we can page out things from a process we're not using, set their bits in the page table as invalid. And um, if only if the process tries to touch that part of the address space, then we get a page fault, we pull a bin off of the disk. That's called demand paging. Um, copy on write was mentioned with fork, right? So the idea with fork was not that you copy all of the data. What you do is you copy the page tables and mark them as read only, so that then if one of the two processes tries to do a write, what happens there is you'll get a page fault um, because that W bit's not set. And then you could copy two copies of the page, mark them both as writable, and now suddenly you've only copied the parts of the um, physical data that are actually going to be different because the two processes decide to change them. And then another version like this is zero fill on demand. You can mark a page as totally invalid, and when you touch it, then what happens is the operating system fills it with zeros and then gives it to you. And this can be a very important mechanism uh, so that we don't accidentally give uh, data from one process to another just because we've reused a physical page. Okay. So um, these are some interesting uses of the page table. I was wondering if there are any questions on that. I'll remind you a bit of this next time as well. But so you can start to see, for instance, this one I think in the middle of how copy on write works is potentially pretty interesting. All right. So um, the next uh, thing that we can talk about here is well, we're going to share um, data now with this multi level page table. There's no reason we can't, right? So here's uh, this is the value of CR3 for process A and the value of CRB for process B. And somewhere in the middle here, notice that we have a couple of entries that end up mapping to this, uh, a whole chunk of the second level page table. So suddenly there's a whole chunk of pages that are shared between the two processes just by mapping uh, a lower level chunk. And so we can have many pages. And so not just a single page, which we could clearly share by uh, mapping something from the bottom level to the same physical page, but we can have a whole bunch of pages just by mapping a middle level chunk. And this is how we can um, do all sorts of complex sharing, uh, potentially um, also during fork, we can set this up so that we uh, copy kind of uh, only the top level pages could point at all the second one level ones rather than having to copy all the bottom level ones. Um, so to summarize, uh, just like before, we kind of showed you this is the virtual memory view, but now we go through a couple of hops. And so there's le many less nulls in here. You see the word null is used a lot less frequently, even though we still have a sparse space. And that's really because big chunks of null end up only showing up at the top level, giving you a couple of nulls. And we don't even bother having a second level of the page table for those things that are null. And so we save a whole bunch of space in the page table. All right. Um, so for instance, here's a, an address in the heap. We take the first couple of bits off, that gives us something in the top level. We take a second set of bits, that gives us something in the second level. And eventually that says that this page in the heap translates to, uh, part of the virtual address space translates to this part in the physical space. All right. Okay. I'm gonna pause. Is there anybody here with questions? I realize that it, um, I don't know, am I talking uh, too fast or too slow? It's kind of a little hard for me to figure uh, feedback here when I've got live folks on the line here. So how we're doing? Okay, good. Okay, I realize that asking questions is a little tricky. Um, can I sign your hat? Sure. Uh, I'm still a little confused about copy on write. Yeah, okay, we can talk about that. So, um, and the question of is this faster than single level paging? 
or just more memory efficient. So it certainly isn't faster because we're doing more lookups. So we're gonna to have to do some work to keep it fast. Um, as far as the copy on write, let me just give that again. That's a good question. So if you think about it, uh, when we copy the address space for fork, we're not copying the physical pages. What we're copying is pointers to the pages. We're copying the page tables. In fact, we even could just copy the top level parts of the page table. We're marking things as uh, read only, okay? And then if one process or the other goes to do a write, at that point, what happens is um, that write ends up causing a fault. So if you imagine that the original process, parent process had things marked writable, you fork, now everything is readable. So now not even the parent can write their pages. Um, the, either the parent or the child tries to do a write, and at that point, we notice there's an attempt to change something, and we say, oh, we can no longer share the same underlying physical pages. What we're gonna do is we're gonna take that page that just got written to, copy it into two physical pages, put one of them into the parent and one into the child, and now they both can write, because we'll mark them as writable, and neither of them knows the difference because uh, neither of them will see the rights of the other one. So we give it the illusion that we copied everything uh, without um, the actuality of copying everything. Um, so uh, why wouldn't we wanna share the changed physical changes? Uh, so I'm not entirely sure I understand. So if, oh, if, um, process, if the parent process writes uh, something, we want to make sure the child doesn't see those rights because that's part of what fork means. Fork gives you a brand new process with completely different uh, address space. So the model is that rights in the parent don't show up in the, in the child or vice versa. Did that answer that question? Right? So, because remember the, the uh, fork is this pretty, um, I know it's a little strange the first time you see it, but the semantics literally are that um, you uh, are getting a full copy and uh, not seeing any changes that your uh, parent or a child have put in there. Okay, so um, how do you know the difference between whether a page has been sent to disk or simply doesn't exist? Ah, so good question. So what you know is um, that, uh, the bit in physical, uh, the physical bit says the page is not in memory. What that means is that the uh, memory management unit fails when it tries to translate. It's up to the kernel to figure it out. Um, whether a zero means it's on disk or a zero means it's invalid or a zero means something more interesting. Um, and what I did mention is when the, when the present bit is zero, the rest of the 32 bits could be used by the operating system to have a flag or give you something about where it is on disk. Um, or there could be uh, things in the kernel that basically make that indication. So, okay, so the key thing here is uh, we now have, uh, we've now sort of gotten rid of a lot of the nulls, but pretty much um, the total size of the page table is still somewhat related to the, the uh, amount of memory used um, the amount of, excuse me, address space used in the virtual memory, not in physical memory. And oftentimes, especially when things are paged out, um, oops, I guess I was writing or something. That's funny. When things are paged out, uh, let's see, what did I do here? How did I, hold on a sec, somehow I wrote on the screen. Is somebody annotating? Can somebody unannotate, please? Um, when uh, we use, uh, I think somebody accidentally drew on the screen because I'm not doing it. Um, so let's see. So anyway, so what I was gonna say, so the size of this page table is related to the size of virtual memory. And we may need to address that because oftentimes there's a lot more virtual memory that's mapped even than there is physical memory. Okay, so um, moving on again. Uh, thank you. Uh, so we can, this idea of multi-level page table is easy to generalize. So for instance, we could have a tree of tables where the top level gives you a segment ID, so we copy the offset, we do a segment, 
And then that gives us a page table, which we then map to give us a physical page number. Um, and we could have access errors and permissions. And so now this is two levels, top level of which is the segment. Next level is page table. We could do multiple levels of page table, et cetera. These are all possibilities. There are multiple levels of translation. Um, we could use that idea to share segments. So here's multiple levels uh, where we have the page table base here. Um, and that uh, basically maps to the same page table in the shared segment, which then we uh, use um, the second level of the mapping to talk about a particular page too. So many options here. And in fact, um, many permutations, okay? And I don't wanna dwell on this too much more, but you could come up with it. We could divide bits up any way we wanted and have multiple levels of page table. The pros of this are we only need to allocate as many entries as we need. Um, so sparse address spaces are pretty easy. Memory allocation is easy because at the bottom, if we have pages, they're all the same size. Sharing is easy because we just share segments or pages, whatever. Cons are the size is still a little big. We still have a pointer per actual page. Page tables need to be contiguous. Um, although that magic 10, 10, 12 configuration, the page table pieces are all the same size as the page, so it uh, swaps well. Um, and if we have lots of levels, then things get slow really quickly. So that question that was there earlier, is this more uh, faster or uh, just more efficient? The answer is more efficient at the moment. Okay. So um, why don't we take a, uh, do you guys wanna take a brief break or should we just finish the last 20 minutes here? Um, I guess we can, uh, I guess we can keep going if people want to, cause they can always step away for a little bit. Uh, what do you think? Plow through, okay. So, <laughs> so if you remember, just as a refresher here, we talked about dual mode operation early on in the course. And I wanna reiterate that a process better not be able to modify its page table. So that means none of these things here, none of these entries that we've got ought to be changeable by the process because that would defeat the whole point, okay? And so we have this idea of dual mode, um, operation in which the hardware gives us at least two modes, one which we call kernel, and the other which we call user. And the modes um, are basically set with the uh, bits in the control register only accessible in kernel mode and only if you take an interrupt or a fault of some sort to get you into kernel mode, okay? And uh, so the user can't easily switch into the kernel. We talked a lot about that before. The kernel can obviously switch back when it's ready to. So x86, again, there's um, four rings, which are priority. Um, most operating systems only use two of them. Uh, kernel mode is at zero and user mode is at three. And uh, this, uh, the ring that's currently in use is called the current privilege level or CPL. Um, newer processors uh, also have hypervisor modes, which are often uh, called ring minus one. But for now, we're gonna talk about the current privilege level, which could be zero or three. Um, and how do we protect things? Well, certain things are only allowed in kernel mode, and in particular, modifying CR3, which is the base of the page table, is only available in kernel mode. And the segment descriptor tables, which I'll show you in a moment, are only available in, in kernel mode. And all page tables uh, must be mapped in uh, memory that can be only modified in kernel mode. So we basically have to make sure that we protect uh, pages. And so here, just so you can see it all together, here is a 16 or 32-bit uh, x86 memory model space. And what you see here is uh, the segment selector, rather than coming from an actual address, comes from the instruction, okay? And so this instruction um, is, uh, for instance, uh, telling us exactly which segment we want to be in. And uh, that might be because we're executing an instruction itself, it would be the uh, code segment, or if we're doing certain operations like stack operations, that's implicit. Otherwise, we can put this in, uh, directly into, uh, take it directly out of the instruction. That segment is then used as uh, a lookup in a lookup table called the segment descriptor table, and there are two of them, um, a global one and a local one. Um, and then once we're done, we basically take the offset, we add the base to it, that's what we talked about before, and now that gives us a, a linear address, 
which now we put into a two-level page table. Okay, so the typical x86 uh, mode translation starts by coming up with a segment selector, which gives you a linear address, and then that linear address is uh, put through a two-level page table. All right, and so this is exactly um, what we talked about before, except we're not wasting address bits picking the selector. That kind of comes out of the instruction. So uh, now, um, what are in the segments? So there is at least segment six segment registers. The SS is for stack, CS is for code, and then the DS, ES, FS, and GS are for data. Um, they reference uh, a segment selector, which actually references um, a table. So rather than the segment registers in the processor pointing at the uh, actual base and, and length of the um, of the segment, we actually have an index and, a, and a, whether it's G or L, and that points to a table full of uh, segment descriptors. And uh, we won't go into this in great detail right now, but what you see is uh, that um, this is very complicated and it's really for backward compatibility. But what you get in this segment descriptor is not only what it's uh, whether you have to be kernel or user to use it, but also where the segment is and the base address and the fact that these are all split up all over the places to try to keep it uh, compatible with 16-bit mode. So. Um, and so how are segments used? I just want to finish that up. So one set of global segments for everyone, another set of local for every process. Um, in legacy applications, they get used exactly like we've been talking about. So you can have uh, chunks of memory for code and data and stacks and their um, they're protected with a length, uh, just like we've been talking about for segments. Um, the code segments RPL is actually the current process uh, level, privilege level. Um, and modern 32-bit operating systems like Linux actually has all of this functionality uh, through the x86, but they ignore it. So in most cases, although there are six segments, um, the first four, uh, other than GS and FS, are all basically um, set where the base is zero and the size is four. And that's basically to eliminate kind of this whole level of translation pretty much does nothing. If you always have a base of zero and a, and a length of uh, four gigabytes, then whatever comes in as the offset is the full space. And that's the way Linux and a lot of modern operating systems use those segment registers, which means they don't bother. Um, the only exception is GS and FS, which are tend to be used like segments and are used for thread local storage and a few other things like that. 64-bit, um, in fact, long mode totally eliminates SS, CS, DS, and ES in the sense that they don't do anything useful. They're all like they have a zero base and no length, and only FS and GS uh, still get work uh, used. OK. All right. And then, of course, for we could go further, right? We could do a four-level page table for a 64-bit address, and in this case, um, by the way, the most of it's not all 64 bits are used for this. Um, usually, only the lower 48 mean anything um, uh, because uh, 64 bits is just a lot of space. We'll talk more about that later. But um, you get sort of nine bits at a time. These are eight byte chunks, and uh, when you're done, that gives you a physical page number, 12 bit offset, which then gives you an address into DRAM. Pretty big. Um, and here it is. So uh, from the architecture spec, you've got a bunch of nine-bit things here. And of course, Intel calls uh, the lowest one a table, and then a directory, and a directory pointer, and then a um, uh, page, uh, um, page mode level, I believe, whatever. It doesn't really matter too much. But um, these are all just uh, 12, 9, 9, 9, 9. Um, and so that's fine, I guess. Uh, but we can also cut off things. So if we, uh, instead of having the table, we had this directory point directly to a page, then we could have two megabyte pages or one gigabyte pages. And so these uh, options are often used for things like the kernel where you're not really uh, paging and there isn't a fragmentation problem. They're just a bunch of memory that you want to pin. Okay. Now uh, you might say, well, what about the IA64, which is an architecture you've probably never heard of because it didn't get very far. Look at all these levels. No. Uh, I mean, this gets pretty ridiculous pretty rapidly, right? Because we're doing all these memory lookups to try to translate, and we're trying to do that with a single address. 
what else could we do? And I wanted to mention the other option, which is out there called an inverted page table. So an inverted page table is uh, the opposite of a forward page table. And in the forward page table that we've been talking about, essentially you take chunks of the address and go forward um, to look at uh, each you know, levels of the table. An inverted page table is exactly like a hash table where you take the virtual page number, it goes through a hashing process to give you a physical page number. And uh, this hashing is actually done entirely in hardware, just like the lookup was done uh, earlier as well. Um, there's a question here about whether page table look lookup is usually pipelined. It's very hard to pipeline something that goes to DRAM uh, because uh, it takes a very long time to get something from DRAM and you can't go to the next link uh, until you get the previous one. Um, so the page table lookup, if it has to go to DRAM, is not going to be pipelined. And so clearly we've got a, we've got a uh, performance issue we've got to address. Uh, hopefully that helped with that question. Um, the, if we can cache parts of it, that's a little bit of a preview, then we might start pipelining it, but it gets tricky. So what does this do for us? What it does is it says that we look up this page number, which might be uh, you know, 52 bits uh, into the hash table to get us the physical uh, page number. And what's good about this is this says that the size of the page table is now more related to the amount of physical memory we're using rather than the amount of virtual address space. So back here, it doesn't matter the fact that it's multiple levels and we have less nulls than we might otherwise. This is still a huge page table and it's very slow. And the size of that page table is related to all of this virtual address space, even when we only have a, you know, a much smaller amount of DRAM mapping. This one, on the other hand, has something that's of order of the size of the DRAM, not of the virtual address space. And uh, there were several processors that used this, some of them still in use and places. The cons are this is a very complicated thing to do directly in hardware because you build a hash table, you have to do uh, tracing down the hash links and so on, all entirely in hardware. OK. So uh, total size of the page table here is more like the number of pages used in physical memory rather than in virtual space. So here's a combination of uh, options here. So we could do simple segmentation, which is very fast context switching. And it's very simple to imagine, uh, but we get a lot of external fragmentation. Uh, single level paging, we don't get external fragmentation, but we have a large table size. Multi-level multi tables let us start wasting less and less memory. And then an inverted page table basically has a table size that's closer to the size of physical memory rather than virtual memory, which is where the page, uh, the, uh, page uh, segmentation and two-level pages come into play. So um, I'd like to, so um, there's plenty of questions, I'm sure, about some of these options here. I, I just wanted to talk you through some of the more common ones to give you uh, a context in which to look through those slides and sort of get a better idea. And I think asking uh, during uh, discussion sessions a little bit more about some of these translation options certainly makes sense for office hours. Um, we have a, a couple of critical questions now that I think we, we need to answer, which is, you know, we're talking about processor takes a virtual address and gives you a translate to memory. And uh, how do you translate this fast enough? I mean, uh, and you think about it, and any of those, you know, those of you that remember from 61C, we've got caching, and so loads and stores are really fast if we have a cache that works. But now suddenly we're talking about going through, you know, four to five levels of memory lookup before we even have a physical address to possibly put in the cache. And so this just sounds awful, like we went way backwards in time in terms of performance, and we got to do something about it. There's another question, which is interesting as well, is what to do if the translation fails, um, get a page fault, and we start doing interesting things like copy and write and so on. But um, we'll, lay, we'll save that for next time. But uh, you know, how is this translation accomplished? And um, what does the MMU need to do to translate an address? Well, in the case of a first level page table, you read the page table entry from memory, check the valid uh, bits, you merge the address, with the, uh, with the offset, and then you go and look at DRAM, um, and then potentially set the access bit in the page table entry in the dirty bit if it's a write. Two-level page table, you read and check the first level, read and check and update the PTE, look at the second level, then get to the third level. You can start to see that there's many DRAM lookups involved here, 
Uh, if it's an nth level page table, even more. And so, you know, the MMU is doing what we would call tree traversal for the page table, where the page table, think of it as a tree. Uh, we're talking forward page tables. It's like a tree of lookups, and we're looking them up uh, in hardware by doing DRAM accesses. And how can we possibly make this go fast? And this uh, hits to this question that was earlier about, you know, can we pipeline it? Boy, we got to do something because this sounds awful. Like we uh, just destroyed the performance of our processor. And so what are we going to do? Well, if you remember from 61C, we have a memory hierarchy. And the trick of this memory hierarchy is we have very fast things at the left side and very big things at the right side. And what we want to do is through cleverness and caching, we would like to have something that has the speed or appears to have the speed of things on the left, but the size of things on the right. And what is that? That's called caching. And in, in the case of uh, looking things up, address translation needs to be at the speed of registers and faster than the L1 cache, because otherwise we get no advantage out of the cache. And its uh, page table is down here in memory. And so there's some mismatch here that we got to figure out, OK? And where is this MMU? So the MMU is typically on the same chip uh, as the processor core, and it's in front of the cache. And here maybe we have a memory bus that gets to our physical DRAM. Uh, the processor reads virtual addresses, um, and uh, they send sends them to the memory system, and it goes through the MMU to the cache. And sometime later, the memory system figures out what data you're actually supposed to get and brings it back. And uh, so what is that MME doing to make this work? And um, you know, on every reference, instruction fetches, loads, stores. We have to read many levels of the page table, uh, maybe have page faults on some of those levels if some of them are off on disk. Um, and then we got to go through caches to memory. And we want to make this fast enough so that a load that's cached in the cache uh, actually looks like it's faster than coming out of memory, OK? And so that seems like it's complicated. And so if you remember from 61C, we have this idea of a cache, which is a repository for copies that can be accessed more quickly than the original. And we're going to make the frequent case fast and the infrequent case um, as less dominant as possible. And um, you know what's interesting about uh, operating systems, I like to joke that operating systems are all about caches. Um, so everything's a cache. So you can cache memory locations and address translations and pages and file blocks and file names and network routes. All of these things we can cache. And uh, we will do that in the rest of the term. Um, and of course, this is only good. So why is this a good caching picture? Because this person's clearly caching everything on their desk. This kind of looks like my desk. Uh, and the idea, hopefully, is that things that you're using frequently are on the desk and things that you're not are somewhere off in a file cabinet. Um, and we want the frequent case frequent enough uh, and the infrequent case not very expensive. And there's a measure called the average memory access time, for you all to remember, which is hit rate times hit time plus miss rate times miss time is at average access time. And we want that to be as low as possible. And the hit rate is the time, basically, uh, if everything were on the cache, that's how fast things are. And the miss rate, uh, excuse me, the hit time is uh, basically the time if everything were on your desk, say, and the miss time is how long if you had to go fetch it. And we'd like it to be the case that most of the time we get something that's close to the hit time rather than close to the miss time. And uh, so if you remember in 61C, we had a picture probably like this, where the processor might have an access time to DRAM of 100 nanoseconds. Uh, but if we could put a cache that was, say, one nanosecond in the middle, um, maybe we could cache things we were using frequently in the SRAM. And so how do we compute average memory access time? So this is a blast from the past. It's uh, the hit rate times the hit time plus the miss rate times the miss time, uh, where the sum of hit rate and miss rate better be equal to 1. Otherwise, we have some really weird probability going on. And uh, the hit rate here, for instance, if it were 90% of this cached idea, then um, the average memory access time uh, would be, well, it's a 0.9 times 1. So the, the um, hit rate is 1 nanosecond. So 90% of the time we get that. And another 10% of the time, we have to go all the way out to DRAM. And then we have to um, 
loaded from the cache. And so this miss time is a combination of going to DRAM and pulling it out of the cache. And so in this hit rate of 90%, we get 11.1 .1 nanoseconds. If we uh, are much better and get a hit rate of 99%, then what you see here is, well, this is pretty good, right? Because 99% of the time we get that one nanosecond, that only 1% of the time we get a 101, and now our average access time has dropped to two nanoseconds. So look at the difference in that, right? That's a, that's a factor of five or better difference in performance just by having a higher hit rate. And so this is, of course, why caching works. Um, and by the way, this miss time, as I mentioned, includes the hit time and the miss penalty, uh, where the miss penalty is the time to go down to DRAM. And of course, another reason that this is coming up uh, is if you remember, if you look at this, right, we've got look up something in a register and then start looking up many levels of page table and then look up, um, take the physical page and then look it up to memory. And you can't afford to translate on every access. So wouldn't it be great if we could cache? Um, and what if we're using caching to make memory faster, but we still have to go to DRAM to do all these translations? All right. So the solution is caching. We'll talk a lot about this next time, but um, we're gonna have a translation cache called a TLB. And it's the translation look aside buffer. And you might ask, why is it called something so uh, strange? Why isn't it called the, uh, the lookup cache or the, the translation cache? And the reason is that, um, well, it was actually invented before caches. But um, the other way you could say this is that IBM uh, invented it and they can call it anything they want. Uh, they could have called it Fred, I suppose, and then we would be talking about, we're going to make this fast by invoking Fred. Um, but nonetheless, it's the TLB. And why is caching going to help? It's going to be about locality. And uh, we'll talk about this later, um, uh, next time. But basically, the idea is that we have temporal locality, which is if we access something, we tend to access it again. And spatial locality, where if we access something, we tend to access something close. And um, that's going to be how we speed this up. And so uh, um, I'm going to end now because we're over our time. But next time, we'll talk about FRED, or TLB, as we call it. But in conclusion, we talked a lot about page table uh, set right now. We talked about how memory is divided into fixed size chunks. Um, and uh, this basically gives us the ability to avoid external fragmentation. We talked about how the virtual page number from the virtual address goes through the page table, however big it is, and eventually map to a physical page number. Um, and then the offset uh, from the virtual address is just copied to the physical address. And large page tables um, can actually be placed into virtual memory and paged out, which is a kind of a cool thing that you probably didn't realize. Uh, we talked about multi-level page tables. Um, virtual addresses, uh, in this case, map to a series of tables, um, and it gives a much better uh, use of space for sparse uh, addresses. And by the way, all the addresses you're ever going to use are sparse, especially in 64-bit, where they're very large. Um, and then we also talked about an alternative used by a few processors called an inverted page table, um, which is uh, using a hash table for translation entries. Um, and now we're starting to talk about um, principles of locality and caching. We'll pick that up next time um, and uh, try to remind you a little bit of uh, your 61C on caching and talk about why that works well for TLB. So. Uh, hopefully this worked out well enough for everybody. Uh, this is our um, first example of a stream and uh, what I will do it again. Uh, yes, we'll definitely do this again on Thursday because uh, this is how we're going. Um, I guess until they uh, let us go back to reality, but uh, we will be posting this as soon as I can. And I'm also going to have it uh, labeled uh, with closed captioning for those of you that wanted to do it. So thanks everybody. Um, talk to you soon. Uh, see you on Thursday. And remember, uh, you should start reattending discussion sessions virtually, and we'll hopefully we'll post all the information for you uh, by Friday. Talk to you later. Oh, everybody's doing uh, virtual office hours, by the way, too. So ciao, and uh, have a good evening. Bye.